and wannabe.com coming live to you today from Melbourne, Australia. Now, with my last case study update out this week, at least for that site that I've been talking about, I thought I would talk about what I'm seeing right now working for new blogs. Now, I've always had a lot of sites on the go. I'm always tailoring slightly what I do as things change in the SEO world. And it means that I'm in a great position to get to experiment, like with lots of points of reference with sites I know really well. So in this live, I'm gonna talk about what is working right now, what I recommend based on your own goals and EAT, which may be the worst acronym ever by Google. Uh, that's expertise, authoritativeness and trustworthiness. Uh, Cause I think that really plays into how I approach things going forward. Uh, you're welcome to ask questions at any time, but I'll only answer ones relevant to what I'm saying as I go. So if it's not relevant to what I'm saying, probably best to leave to the end and then I'm happy to answer whatever. Um, I do wanna say up front too that some of what I say might seem a little bit confusing and that's because there's pros and cons to every approach. I can't just go, this is exactly how you should do it. It'll have the most success, blah, 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 blah. Um, for a start, everyone's definition of success is different. What mine is won't be yours. So, you know, there's that. And there's lots of other things that factor in for each of us, for all individuals, that will make different choices best for our situation. Okay. So I'm hoping I'm explaining pros and cons of different approaches really well. And then you can make a choice for yourself. And of course, I'm here to ask, answer questions either on this live or you can always ask in the DNW group later. Um, so, first thing is, I always get a lot of questions about how wide a niche should be, whether you're better general niche, how niche you should go, whether a micro niche is too small. And basically to me, it always seems like bloggers just don't trust themselves. You know, those in a broader niche are like, oh, I should have a more narrow niche, that would be easier. And when you're in a narrow niche, I should have a more broad one, which I completely understand because I used to write off my frustrations having too broad a niche as well. Um, but you know what, none of these statements are true or false. Those pros and cons I talked about, definitely play a part here. Now, looking at it from an SEO perspective, because you know, I can't help that, um, being more niche can definitely make it easier to rank, okay? Now, a lot of my rankings with my lifestyle blog, even though lifestyle is about as non-narrow niche as you could get, it's about as general as you could get, uh, in the case study are because I am a .au, okay? So even though my site was a hugely broad niche, you know, I did pick lifestyles so I could write about anything. Being AU did help niche me down a bit, although that's still a very big niche, right? Being Australian, that's like, I don't know how many people are in Australia these days, 25 million, maybe more. You know, that's still a very big niche. Um, but all of these things is where relevancy plays a part when it comes to SEO. And I don't even think it's just SEO. I think just in general, it's easier to build a community, you know, fan base, all of that. The um, the more relevant you are to what people want to know and what they're looking for. So relevancy is really big in SEO. I don't think it's discussed enough. We're too busy talking about links and keywords and relevancy even plays into each of those, you know. So the more relevant your site is for a search term, the easier it will be for you to rank. So that's why it can be easy to outrank those big sites. Like I know in travel, that's like TripAdvisor or something. Um, it, you can outrank them just because they're so broad. If you show that you're more relevant for something, you know, that's really going to give you a big bonus. And that's what happened to me with the .au. You know, I went for really competitive keywords, but they were articles written in America and Britain on topics where they don't directly translate. You know, for some things it doesn't really matter. For others, it can matter. Um, but even when it doesn't matter too much, say like in travel, you know, if I wrote about a destination um, that wasn't even in Australia, I would find I'd get better Australian rankings because it's like Google knew I was Australia and just decided I was more relevant because of that too. So all these things can always play a part. Um, but although that can help you get rankings because you're more relevant, where you cannot be helped with SEO is it can get harder to get more links, for example. Um, so the more broad you are there, the more opportunities there are, right, to work with people um, both from a like sponsored point, post point of view or just from getting a link point of view. Uh, you know, you also narrow what you can talk about the more niche you are. So that can lead to the point where maybe you can't really grow any bigger or you run out of things to say. Uh, I think you have to be pretty niche though to really run out of things to say, um, but that can definitely happen. So it's like a smaller niche can be a shortcut to growth with Google traffic for sure. Um, 
but it can also limit your growth at some point. And it can just make it harder to do things like that link building. So maybe, you know, if you're a bit more broad, it'd be a little bit easier um, to get to those top spots because you could get more links, for example. So hopefully that makes sense. I also want to talk for a minute about micro niche sites not working. So sites that I used to build, for example, around one product, so really, really small. So say you build a product on vacuum cleaners. Now, I don't know why people talk about them not working. That is like not true. If you think about the relevancy, the authority, all of that sort of stuff, the smaller an issue are generally the easier that is to build up, right? But where it is a lot harder now and why I don't do it, it's about trying to get links to those types of sites. If you've gone really specific to a product blog, how do you get a link to them? Who's gonna to link to that? People aren't really doing it naturally. The more commercial you look, which is hard not to with just a single product, the harder it is to get a link. And a lot of the like more gray hat approaches I used to take, like PBNs, I just think they're getting less effective all the time and they're just not worth the effort. You know, it's just easier to make it, to go white hat and have a site where people want to link to it and, and do things like the link building challenge like we have in this group. I just think that's a lot easier. So it does fall back into the category that in some ways it's easier to rank, being, but being so niche makes it um, harder to do things like getting links. And you definitely, when you go that small, you do run out of things to say eventually. So let's backtrack a little bit and talk about EAT some more. So that's that expert authority and trustworthiness. Well, fundamentally, it's about establishing your site and yourself if you're a visible presence behind it as an authority and really thinking about how you can do that both within your site and off your site. Okay. So whatever your niche you want to work on becoming seen as an expert and authority. Okay. Especially you personally, if you've got a visible presence on the blog, but at least your blog should be seen that way. So what does that mean? You know, if you're currently creating a new site or you're thinking about maybe even changing what your current blog is about, maybe going more niche is generally the way people think or possibly going more broad. For all of this, it can definitely be easier going more narrow, okay? I think, you know, just about all of us are a one-man show or maybe you're lucky enough that your partner's involved too. And if you're trying to be the expert, you know, of all of health, if you just want to be a general health blog, you want to be seen as an expert of that, that is like, I'm not even sure that's possible, right? That's only, you know, you can, I think in most niches you can maybe name one or two people that can maybe get away with that. But they've been around a long time and just imagine the work that went into being seen like that. You know, I would pretty much say it's just about impossible. And same with any niche. You want to be seen as the expert in travel. You know, how realistic is that? You know, it's going to be very difficult, a real uphill battle. And same for any more general niche. Now, what this means is you don't, you can't, it's not that you can't have a more general niche for your blog, but I think you will go better if you maybe specialize on certain subjects within that. Okay, so you could still be a more broad health blog, but maybe you specialize um, in a certain type of diet or something like that, where you can really build yourself up as that expert and authority. So, you know, another example, you could write about lots of aspects of parenting, but maybe, you know, you're really great with babies. So you write a lot about babies or in travel, it could be a certain destination. Okay. Um, and I do notice that over time, I think a lot of us bloggers sort of end up doing that anyway. It just sort of seems to evolve. So if you're at the beginning and you're like listening to me and going, oh, I have to pick, pick an area. Um, well, one, I'm not saying you have to. I'm hoping you're understanding uh, the pros and cons of everything during this. But two, these things do tend to just evolve. You'll certainly notice if with Google, especially if you're tracking your rankings, like how you go on your main keywords, that eventually you will find patterns. And when you find that if you write about certain topics, Google has decided you're the authority and they're going to rank you really well, it's kind of hard to stop writing about them and all those things will sort of follow. But even just going beyond SEO, I really think there's so many benefits to this because really at the end of the day, Google is really just trying to replicate um, sort of what can happen in real life, okay? And the reality is, and what people want, it's easy to create an engaged audience and a real community behind your blog when you have something more specific in it wasn't part of my blog ever. Um, but you know what? How do you even establish as an expert in family travel? You know, like you can't. There are tons of people in there that consider themselves experts because really the barrier of entry is incredibly low. Um, and even people who haven't traveled with kids can think they're an expert. And 
like who can like you know how do you work that out right um so there's no way i can be seen in that group as the expert because there's just too many however say i'm more concentrated on family travel just in my region of australia i narrowed it down to melbourne i do have a site on for melbourne for families um or just the state that i live in you know that would be so much easier be so much easier to be seen as that expert or authority which doesn't mean you can't have other people in there that are you know like the dnw facebook group i imagine if you're listening to this you're in it if not join up um you know there's plenty of other people that really know their stuff and that's really good it makes the group more valuable and i really love that um but i'm still able to be seen as the expert because i still bring something else into the group okay whereas in family travel there is just nothing i can bring in that thousands hundreds of thousands of people maybe millions can't bring in as well and that's kind of where your problem arises now you can still oh sorry i do want to say a little bit more about that where that really helps too in building that community is when you also really get to know your audience and you really understand their needs which is really how to do in a general niche it's just too many and it's kind of mind-blowing um, when you get smaller that's much easier to cater to them like with great affiliate offers you know, with um, booting your own products, you know, any way you want to monetize, really, the more niche your audience is, the better you can cater to them, the easier it is to have that benefit of making money from your blog as well. Now, building more general sites so like the lifestyle blog in my case study, 100% still works. You know, you can see that for yourself. It's doing well and, you know, I'm hopeful it'll get to five figures a month without much more work. I just need you know, well, Google will keep it on its upward trajectory, hopefully. And I just need Australians to embrace Amazon. But, you know, it will be solely dependent on those factors on SEO and on Amazon. So if your goals are just this, you don't need to worry about some of what I'm saying. However, I do think you need to be mindful of EAT, like that expert and authoritativeness. And you should be using your own name, ideally, and trying to grow some authority as I believe it'll only become more and more important in Google because to me, it makes sense that it will. Okay, people want the best sources on the internet when they go to Google and search. So Google wants to show them that. This is a good way of trying to work that out. Um, but you know, for me, I don't mind having some play sites like my lifestyle blog, but to me, they're sites that I play with, you know, make a bit of money for sure, and then I'll sell. Um, when I wanna grow a sustainable business, you know, that's not what I'm looking for. Okay, I think it's great as a backbone. And I, you know, I talk a lot about my three stages of blogging success. And I feel like doing what I did on the case study, like really concentrating on SEO and affiliate marketing and getting it to a good income earning level so you can justify time to grow further. You know, I see that as the first two stages. Just get it up, get it, get some traffic, get some money. And then the final stage being really to scale that. And the way I really see you doing that is by becoming that expert and authority, by building that community around your brand and servicing with things like products. So at the moment for me personally, you know, I like building those sites to sell. They are really, you know, financially really nice. There's good tax benefits to that too here. Um, but I am getting a bit sick of this churn and burn too. So, you know, my next site in the case study, I think will be more interesting because I really want to build a sustainable business around a second site. So at the moment for me, that's definitely Digital Nomad Wannabe. Um, but I want another site where it's not just relying on that, but I do want that engaged community and to build out all of that to really work on that EAT. You know, and I'm really passionate about really establishing that site as the authority because that's how I see that sustainable business growing. I can build a real community around it. I hope to sell my first product later this year, but I'm 100% still doing that affiliate marketing and SEO, everything that I teach in Build Blog Freedom Fast Track and on Digital Nomad Wannabe, everything I did in the case study as the backbone. Okay, because it needs to earn some money to be worth my time building that community. Um, so I see that as really important. Really for this new site, I feel like I'm taking everything I've learned because I had a very different approach with Digital Nomad Wannabe compared to my case study, compared to my travel blog and all my other sites. And I wanna to bring together everything I've learned from all those different experiences to really build this site where I'm utilizing like all my skills and everything I know to really build a successful site. So definitely, if you haven't read the latest case study, give it a read. It's, I think it's interesting and it does give you a good overview over the 18 months that I did the case study for that site. Uh, you can read all about Leanna's site, who I can see is watching. So hello, she's going to keep being in it. Um, and 
you know, get onto the new case study too, because I'll be doing that plus more. And I just feel like I have so much to say on this topic. So I hope what I've said today uh, has been good and it's been understandable. I know it's at quite a high level, um, but you know, as, as people in the DNW community, I hope you're at that level or striving to be. So I like to push you forward. Um, and you know, if you really want some help getting that SEO and affiliate marketing right, definitely join Build Blog Freedom Fast Track, okay? It really does just go over step-by-step step all the things that I did in the case study. So I'm happy to answer questions. I can see Sophie's got one, and I know there were some in the group, but I will prioritize live questions if anyone other than Sophie has them. Uh, she's asking, how many weeks approximately do you imagine you'll spend on the new site you intend to be your second sustainable business? I'm trying really hard to spend one day a week on it, and I'm really struggling, um, but that's what I see at the moment. So one day a week, honestly, that wouldn't be more than six hours. Yeah, because I get interrupted a lot. And even though I try for one day, you know, I still answer questions in the Facebook group for other things and my email and all of that. So, uh, yeah, I, I do hope to ramp that up, though, at some stage, Sophie, for sure, because I just, I feel really passionate about that project. It's what I want to spend more time on. Leanna, how much time do you plan spending on the community aspect? Yeah, once I get a Facebook group, and that's why I'm like really trying to get as much, I'm trying really hard to not get to the community part until I've got that good SEO and affiliate marketing backbone, like I've talked to Leanna when, when we uh, work on her site. Because I know once I start building the community, you know, like Facebook groups, they do take a fair bit of time and that's going to be tricky until I can find the right person to help me out with that. Like they'd have to have all the, the knowledge I have and that's really hard. Um, so to be fair, I mean, I think a Facebook group, you're probably going to spend a couple of days really working out what you want to do before you start. But really ongoing, it's probably, you know, you're probably looking at half an hour a day and that would be the main way I do the community. Um, so it's it's not massive, but, you know, I know that you don't have much time to work on this either and it uh, definitely takes some time. But if anything, I probably found the group got less effort over time, even with the growth, because there's more people in there helping out. So that can be good too. And you definitely would want to spend like a few hours a month evaluating what you're doing and trying to do better. Um, Email marketing too would definitely be part of community building and that would take a bit longer. But that's a little bit more set and forget. You know, you just sort of got to work it out and then do that. Um, to be honest, I see the most effort in the site actually not being any of these things, but finding really good partnerships because I think travel commissions are really crappy. And I think one of the ways to get around that and still somewhat write about travel is to try and build direct partnerships with brands. Like if anyone's ever followed my tan feed and stuff that Yason would write and talk about at TBEX conferences, you know, they work directly with brands and then build up better commissions. So 100% that will be my focus when I have the audience size that can allow that. And I imagine that taking a lot more time. So at that point, I guess I'd hope to spend, you know, more like, you know, 15 to 20 hours a week. I can't imagine I'd ever have longer than that because I love doing my courses and I don't want to dump that. Um, Stephanie, what ratio do you suggest for buying guides versus other content? It depends. Like, there is nothing bad. The more buying guides you have, the more relevant you'll be for them, the better they'll go in Google. Um, I just put other stuff on there because I want to be seen as a blog and it's easier to get links. Um, but the higher ratio you have, the better they will go. There is nothing bad about having more or less. Um, the more content you have on any topic is going to make you be seen as more relevant, so you'll do better. Dan, you mentioned there are thousands if millions of tra family travel bloggers. Many have traveled to lots of places. Are you suggesting they focus on one destination they know well in order to become an authority? Would it make sense to be for where you live? What are your suggestions, especially for new travel bloggers? Um, well, I hope you got out of this that you don't have to do any of this stuff. You can keep more broad if you want, but you will find it easier to go more specialized. Now, I was very broad in family travel, but it did, did become one destination where I did just start going really well and did inspire me more. And the reason why there was a lot of content on it was it was also a destination I really loved. So, um, you know, it was all kind of a bit of a cycle effect, um, which made it more so. I, I never really worked on becoming an authority about it, though, because I just, to be honest, by that point, I really didn't care about my travel blog <laughs> and I just did what was quick and easy. Um, so whether someone else should, uh, you know, it's up to you. But I think if you really want to grow a really big sustainable business from your blog, you really need to think about, one, some type of differentiation to all the other family travel bloggers. And two, if you, I think if you really think about how you can really help people, just putting out the same content that means of other people 
do doesn't really help them. You know, like I see all the time in family travel bloggers, you know, I'm doing it because I want to show other people they can do it with kids too, as though no one else has ever done that before. Um, and you know what, I was the same. But to be honest, I really struggled. It was only really Erin I ever found back then that really traveled with tiny kids like I had. Um, you know, they were like zero and, and one. <laughs> so, you know, that was, and even her kids were a bit older. So I really didn't see it with that age. So to me, it felt a bit unique at the time, but obviously that changed really quickly. I didn't keep being unique because of that. Um, but if, if your sole purpose is to show people that it's possible, well, everybody else always does that. So what is your purpose? Um, so I would try and go a little bit beyond that. I don't want to be depressing either. Like I said, with my lifestyle, you can still make, you can still make things work. But I think if you really want to be someone that has a great sustainable business, you need to be seen as an expert in something. And I do think family travel is too broad. Um, if you were trying to pick somewhere where it doesn't have to be where you live, you know, my new destination site is Malaysia. I, I did live there for, well, it wasn't really a year. It was like a year on and off. So it was more like six months if you add it up. Um, and we go there a lot. We go there next weekend, actually, <laughs> coincidentally. Um, you know, I started by trying to do round home with the Melbourne family side I started and honestly just didn't inspire me at all, even though I love Melbourne. So I'm not really sure why, but it just didn't. Um, you know, I think you definitely, there is no point trying to build yourself up as an authority on something that you're not interested in because you really do need to have a passion behind it um, or you'll stop showing up and like that's just not going to work when you're at that level. When you're just trying to build a site that earns money and income and build that passive income, like there is a lot good about that model because you don't have to keep showing up. Whenever I've taken time off, actually everything just raised by itself, you know, increased by itself anyway. Um, I don't know. I hope that makes sense. I feel like I had a lot of roundabout arguments then, but that's because um, there is no right answer. You can, build a, you can build a blog that can make you enough money to support yourselves. No problem, I feel, with SEO and affiliate marketing and family travel. It's just if you want to be seen as the authority in family travel, like I don't think that's that realistic. Um, I'm not even sure who I'd put out there as that. Uh, you know, I'm not really, so maybe there isn't a huge one. <laughs> There's people like my travel blog, of course, but I feel like they're a lot more than family travel and they have done a really good job of establishing themselves as an expert in several things. Um, but I think to go into it as that being your goal, you know, you're, you're signing yourself up for a, a lot more work than maybe you need to do. Uh, Sophie, in regards to building links for someone who has very limited time to work on an extremely new site, would you say it's more beneficial to just get one guest post done a week or concentrate on getting multiple collabs and other quick strategies? Yeah, I, I'm, I tend to concentrate on the multiple collabs because it's just, you know, it is quick and easy. But for this site, my new one, I really want to concentrate more on the guest posts. I haven't got there yet, but I plan to. But I've been doing collabs on the site anyway, just when it's on that region, because I can't help myself. Because um, I think I think at the beginning, the quick and easy and getting a few is probably actually a good way to go. Like, But not do that forever. So maybe, you know, your first few months, if you could do a couple of collabs a week, that's going to help build you up a bit quicker. But for that expert and authoritativeness and, you know, all of those EAT things, um, doing guest posts on really highly authoritative sites uh, is going to make a bigger difference. So, you know, I definitely plan to switch it over. And, yeah, I, I mean, I guess that is what I'm doing. I just, yeah, I'm doing the collabs because it's quick and easy at the moment. I don't have time to think through the guest posting strategy. Um, but I actually don't think it's that bad. It'll get you up a bit quicker. Apparently my DA is 20 and I've barely done any, so that's... I mean, it's DA, it doesn't necessarily mean anything, but my traffic is definitely going up really well. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. I would do collabs for, uh, you know, a few months and, and just get a grip more on your content, what, you want, what you're writing about, um, and then think about the guest posts. And trying to go as high as you can. I think people, bloggers aim a bit too low for guest posts a lot of the time, and they just do it on any site they can. You know, I'm 100% only going for top sites, like blogs, uh, commercial sites, ones that are really focused on my destination. That's all I'm going to be looking at. I want biggest bang for my guest post word as possible. I can't see any more questions in the live. So I'm going to switch over the screen to the ones beforehand. And, and if you've got questions live, just um, you know, ask them. I'll get to it. Uh, Claire asked, I'm wondering if I need to bother with a Facebook page or should I be making a closed group instead? I'm not sure if anyone is seeing my page to like it anyway. 
Uh, I think there's a benefit to having both. I personally am a big fan of Facebook groups and I think that's where it's at. So I would 100% have a Facebook group over a page. But even if you don't use your page much, you know, if you want to use ads at some point, that's when you're definitely going to want a page. I like to do my lives on my page. It just makes it slightly more accessible. Um, and then I share them in the group. Uh, I'm not really sure if that's 100% the best strategy, to be honest. Uh, but I think it's still useful to have a page. I think if you ever want to work with brands, you know, a page is a good starting point. I know when I want to contact a brand, I look for their page, like to message them or whatever. Um, I think that that's really useful. Uh, so I would, yes, I would recommend both. I don't put any effort into this Facebook page, as you can tell if you look down it. Um, but I still find it a useful tool to have. Just check there's nothing live. No problem, Sophie. Uh, Brooke. Okay, yeah, this was a good question. I have a question regarding your authority site project. I want to do this and have started a site, but I don't want to base the monetization on Amazon or product buying guides because nothing I talk about within my niche or normally recommend can be bought on Amazon. I understand other ways to monetize as far as affiliates, long, slow road to make anything. Um, I wouldn't agree with that, but anyway. And then eventually getting businesses to pay me for features, etc., or place ads. This is the part I wish I could straight into as it feels more genuine to me considering my content focus. But they are all way down the road after I built the site up to be enough value to pursue those types of revenue. I'm okay with patience, but like you make the point with your authority project, you need to monetize the site enough to justify continuing to pull that energy in. So I know I'm on the right track and I'm not going to spend a year on something I really can't ever get to a point that makes sense. What would you suggest for someone who doesn't have a site that meshes well with writing product guides for things you can buy on sites like Amazon? As far as the fastest path to some sort of profit so that at least the cost of the site and hosting and then maybe paying someone to help with the content can be covered. Um, just out of interest, uh, Brooke, I'll say first, my new case study, I'm not concentrating on Amazon buying guides. I don't see it working with the content. So you might find that extra interesting and so might other people. Um, what I think a lot of this comes down to is one, really understanding your audience, really understanding what you're trying to achieve really understanding how you're going to help your audience. Okay, the best forms of monetization come from really helping people. Now, there's been a few times in the DW group where I've written, oh, how do you help people with your blog? And people still say stuff like, I share stories, blah, blah, blah. Um, to me, that's not really helping people. How do you help them? How do you change their lives for the better? These don't have to be like solving world hunger, but you know, what do you do to help them? Um, when you concentrate on that, I think that's when you truly, one, help people. And two, are able to build that community and business where you have that sustainable business that I've talked about a bit in this as well. Um, so I think being really clear on all those things should help show you a path. It's actually in the fast track, in the Blog Freedom Fast Track. The first week is focused on this, really defining your niche and understanding how you're helping people because uh, I think it's really easy to get off the path. Um, so what types of things can you do? The thing that jumps out to me is a product, right? If you're really focusing on some type of audience, you know, and hopefully, um, you know, you want to do the things we talked about just now with the authority and being seen as an expert and all that, a product is a natural fit for that. What's really great about a product too, and one of the reasons why I'll be bringing one out this year, hopefully, is part of why I want to do this case study with a new site, right? I really want to achieve everything that I'm setting my mind to for this new site and putting it out there like this will mean I have to because I'll be embarrassed otherwise. Um, but anyway, back to the point. A good thing about a product is it actually helps establish you as an expert on a, or an authority. Something that really shocked me when I bought out my ebook on DNW, my first, actually it was my second product technically, um, it was just suddenly people talked about me. I would see myself talked about in different Facebook groups and that. And it was like people had more respect for me and they saw me more as that authority and expert. And it was kind of strange to me because, you know, nothing had changed for me, um, but it did make that big difference. It doesn't have to be a book. Um, you know, some people even do physical products. Sorry, a book can be physical, but anyway. Um, but if you're doing a more niche audience, all these things can be easier. I mean, I don't know what your niche is, so it's hard to say. Um, but you really don't need much of an audience as long as you cater to them well to sell products to. So definitely that would be something I would think about if you're less inclined on the affiliate path. Um, but I think when you concentrate on helping people, often there are affiliates involved in that just quite naturally. You can also do things like 
like your ideal audience might be someone who comes to a buying guide on your website, but your ideal audience doesn't have to necessarily see that buying guide. You know, like I had a lot of them in travel. Um, I didn't share them with my email list necessarily unless I thought it was really relevant to them. I didn't share it on social media. It was just there for the Google traffic. So, I mean, there's ways like that around it too. Um, but really one of the fastest paths to make money anyway is a product because you just you just don't need a big audience. You know, did you know my wannabe doesn't have a huge audience, uh, but it's one of my most successful sites income-wise because um, of, of selling products and how I've established a strong community. In fact, I was listening to a podcast recently and the guy talked about, I don't remember who, it was an interview with him too, so it was someone else's podcast. But anyway, you might have heard like discussions about a minimum viable product if you've ever looked into making your own product. And that's about selling the product to start with, like with as least effort as possible into making it. So it's still okay, but it's maybe, you know, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles yet, just to make sure it sells before you put a lot of effort in. And just to put out there, I'd never do that. I'm too much of a perfectionist. It's always, always try for awesome. Um, but he talked about having a minimum viable audience, which I found really interesting. So trying to think what's the smallest audience um, that is viable for you to make the amount of money you want from your blog, and then really servicing like the crap out of them, to put it a little bit crudely. You know, just giving them everything they need, really being their answer to all their issues in that area and, and really helping them out. You know, so kind of like what I do in DNW. If you can do that, you really don't need a big audience. You can move on to the ads later. You know, you can work on growth in the background with SEO and all of that. But with products, I really think there can be a really uh, much quicker and easier way in some ways um, to upping monetization. Uh, but they do require that more um, engaged audience, okay? But the size is less important. So I really hope that helps, Brooke, or at least gives you some food for thought. Now let me go back to the live. Okay, well, no one else is asking me questions. So it's my Friday morning. I, I know it will be Thursday for some of you. Thank you for joining me. Uh, if you're watching this on replay, you're always welcome to ask questions in the group. It's better to ask in a new post in the group because in the live, um, it's hard to see comments. It puts it at the time you put them and then they're not at the bottom and I can't find them. Um, but ask questions in the group. So if you're not in the group, that's dnwcommunity.com. We'll take you there and I believe there's a link on this live. It was kind of cool when I set up the live today. They're like, do you want to put a call to action to your group? And thought, why not? But I'm not sure what it looks like. I guess I'll see you in a minute. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining me and I hope this has really helped you.